soil is not one of those options. The reason for this is that Gene McElroy, the extension agent for the University of Florida, said some 10 to 12 years ago, Florida soil is good for only one thing, and that's holding up the plant. The reason for this is the so Florida soil around here is very poor. It's essentially a beach soil, uh, nothing but sand has no nutrients in it, no organic material, and is full of soil sand. Another good reason is most of us don't own a rototiller, and we don't want to. So, that leads us to alternative vegetable gardening solutions. Today, we're going to cover four areas, raised beds, grow boxes, containers, and a hydroponic. First up, a raised bed growing system. My preference and my favorite. It's an excellent choice if you wish to do some large scale uh, backyard vegetable gardening. You can see from the picture here, one of the first obvious choices is that uh, if you have limited mobility, uh, it provides access uh, without having to be able to bend down and stoop to the ground. So the overall advantages of a raised bed gardening system is that the elevated height uh, reduces bending especially important as some of us grow older. Um, additionally, it can be filled with the substrate of your choice, um, which allows for a much better organic choice uh, than the native soil. Since you're not planting in condensed, uh, in compacted soil, it also allows for a higher density planting. Raised off of the ground, it also prevents the uh, garden site from flooding during the uh, occasional heavy rains that we have in uh, South Florida. It also helps with one of the local problems we have with vegetable growing here, which is nematodes. I'll explain why a little later. Basically because of the fact that here, the native soil has no organic material. And the more organic material you have in the soil, uh, nematodes are uh, shy away from. And finally, it helps with weeding. This may not seem as intuitive. However, when you're walking along and you see a, a weed growing and if you have a ground level garden, it means you gotta bend over, stoop down and pick it up, pull it out. However, if you have a raised bed and you can walk by and just reach and pick it without bending over, you're much more prone to uh, pull up a weed. So how do you build a raised bed? You can go online, there are a number of websites. There are two of them here, uh, EarthEasy and uh, Gardeners.com, and they will provide you with all the materials that you need. However, there are also ways that you can do this with a homegrown system. Uh, my preference is by using uh, two by eights. Um, two by eights will give you a nominal height of 16 inches. Um, this bed here is four feet by 16. A raised bed can be any length that you want, but you want to make the uh, width or depth no more than four feet. And the reason for this is that you can't reach effectively any more than two feet into the garden. So you can reach it from either side by reaching just over two feet. I also like raised beds because if you need to stake something or you need to create a trellis, it's easy to add a garden stake by just attaching it to the side of the raised bed. You can also uh, build it with uh, half inch plywood. These are 12 inches high. Uh, they work also just as effectively. Um, it means you have to bend down a little bit more. But the thing to remember is whether you have it 12 inches or 16 inches or whatever height, the higher it is, the less stooping, but it means more substrate that you have to add. Again, here the advantage is by adding these uh, 
defense stakes, you're able to create a trellis very easily. It also allows for you to be able to run your uh, micro irrigation system. This is just another example of a 12 inch raised bed. Um, the dense growing, you can grow onions here. And again, an uh, example of the micro irrigation. Another alternative to a homegrown, homemade system is by using uh, hail or straw bales. It makes it for a very uh, organic system. Um, and again, you can fill the interior with any organic media that you want. And at least for the first year, you have a little bench to sit on. Uh, it will deteriorate, obviously, as time goes on. And another uh, very cost-effective way uh, of creating a raised bed. So additional tips for raised bed gardening is, first of all, modern treated wood is fine to use. Uh, the FDA and the University of Florida have both tested it. Modern treated wood uses copper, and it's been found safe. Uh, it does not affect the uh, vegetables. I like to start the first year with lining the bottom of the bed uh, with cardboard of multiple layers of paper before adding the substrate. Um, this only affects the first year, but it does help keep out some uh, nematodes and other insects from penetrating into your uh, raised bed. As with any growing platform, you need to check the pH before planting. Um, vegetables enjoy a slightly acidic. Uh, there are numerous online uh, vegetable guides for what's the ideal pH. Use micro irrigation if possible. Uh, remember you wanna water the uh, ground and not the uh, uh, leaves of the plant. Uh, micro irrigation stops splashing. Uh, splashing is uh, especially detrimental to tomatoes. It washes up and uh, creates black spot and other diseases. Um, important uh, consideration before you start is choosing a location that is a sunny location. And by definition for vegetable growing, that requires six to eight hours of sunlight. Remember, once you start this, you're not going to be able to move it. So. Uh, choose your location very carefully. And the nice thing about a raised bed is it allows for polarizing uh, during the summer. Polarizing the media means you put clear plastic over the soil and let it bake for two to three months and it kills all the harmful uh, bacteria, viruses, and um, insects that are in the soil. The raised bed is a good way of doing this because it gives you a good platform to be able to have a secure fit of the clear plastic around the edges. The tighter the fit, uh, the more heat that it traps inside. Some other tips for raised beds are number one is you've got to add a nutrient uh, mixture. Uh, you can go buy commercial mixes. Um, they're very nice, they are, uh, but they're also expensive. There are numerous ones at garden centers and big box stores. Or you can buy the product in bulk. In Charlotte County, a local source is Green Planet Recycling uh, out on Route 17. In my travels around the state, I've found that almost every county has uh, at least one local site that you can obtain material from. The cost difference is that uh, locally, I can buy a yard, a cubic yard of planting material for about $12 a yard. Whereas if you go to the garden center, you're gonna spend eight to $12 per bag, which is typically only one to two cubic feet. So you're gonna be spending 20 to 30 times as much money uh, by buying a commercial mix. Um, some people argue that the commercial mix is supposed to not have uh, weeds, et cetera, in it. And that's probably true. However, remember weed seeds are airborne and from my experience, whenever I've even used the expensive commercial mix, uh, that only works for the first year. You have just as many weeds in the uh, bulk planting and the second year as you do um, from the, uh, the bulk product. So the commercial mix, uh, if you have a small one, maybe the way you'll go for you. But if you have a truck and if you have a way to do it, 
the bulk product, uh, in my opinion, is the best solution. The second way that you can do alternative vegetable gardening is with containers. Uh, one of the easiest and most inexpensive are grow bags, boxes, vertical systems. Here you see leafy vegetables being grown on uh, bags. Again, uh, there's a website here, there's numerous ones. You can go out, you can get the bags already uh, filled or just uh, perforated and ready to use your own media in there. Uh, you can also see again that they have a micro irrigation system along here. Uh, if you use a timer and a pump system, you may even be able to uh, do this without watering it yourself each day. Another type of container is the vertical bags. These grow bags here. Uh, I like these personally because you you can change your pH of your growing media and fertilizer uh, to acclimate to each type of a vegetable that you grow. Um, you can buy these typically at a local growing center, or you can again you could go out to a on uh, online site. Uh, you can get them either pre-filled or empty. They already come. It's hard to see in this picture, but they already have perforated to allow for drainage. But um, here you have shown an example of potatoes. I've grown peppers, tomatoes, squash, zucchini in these bags and find them very effective. Um, again, remember, once you uh, start one of these, by the time you add the uh, media and the water and everything, make sure you have the location that you want because they're not easily moved. A third type of solution is a uh, grow box. The original grow box is a commercial patented product called Earth Box. You go out to the website and they have various uh, configurations that you can buy. Um, very effective. The one thing about the Earth Box product is it's somewhat expensive. Um, or there are also alternatives. Um, this website will give you the instructions on how to create your own uh, self-contained watering system. It's very similar to an earth box, um, not quite as fancy, um, but it does grow vegetables. Here are examples of the homemade self-contained watering system. Again, the, the cost to create this is 10 to 13, 15 dollars plus the cost of the media the fertilizer and your plants. Uh, as you can see here, we've got basically three vegetables. We have a pepper on the uh, left, beans in the middle, and a tomato plant on the right. Uh, this is a watering tube. I'm going to show you how to create this uh, completely in just a second. So what you need to purchase are two 18-gallon containers that are sold in basically any big box store. You could get them anywhere from four, seven, eight dollars. You need two of those. You need one of these baskets, which is also grown in, uh, sold in any growing uh, uh, garden center. Um, and you need a, uh, about an 18 to 24 inch section of one and a half inch PVC. You take one of the containers and you invert the basket and with a Sharpie, you make a line all the way around the container. Then you invert that same container and you draw around a line around the perimeter of the basket. Then you remove the basket and about three quarters to an inch inside, you draw a second line. Then you take that piece of PVC that I told you that you needed for your water tube you put it in one of the corners and again, use your Sharpie and draw a circle around it. So what the bottom of your second container is going to look like is you have an inner circle here uh, from the basket. And then you have a circle here uh, from your watering tube. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a jigsaw or other cutting device and where that horizontal line was, the height of the basket, we're going to cut all the way around 
the, uh, the container. And we're going to flip it upside down and also cut a circle on the inner circle from where the basket was. And then we're going to cut a small circle for where the uh, watering tube is. Having done that, and then you're going to take a drill with about a 3 8 to half inch drill bit, and you're going to start drilling holes randomly around the top, um, 12, 15, 18 holes. The idea behind these holes is that the bottom of this container is going to have water, which is going to seep up. You're also going to have water that's going to intrude uh, by rain, and these holes are going to allow for the excess water to drain into the bottom. Then we take one of the lids, and again, using our Sharpie, we trace the inner ledge all the way around, making sure that we go around the PVC watering tube. Then we cut out the uh, line that we drew with our Sharpie, and then we drill out the hole for the watering tube. And then this would be the way that the lid looks. There, we've done all of the cutting. So now we're going to start assembling it. We take the second container, which was uncut. We lay our basket in the bottom in the middle of the container. We invert the second container, which we have uh, cut halfway to the same height as the basket. We pre-drilled for the water tube and the drainage tubes. And you force that down to where it rests right on top of the basket. This little white dot here is a drainage hole. Uh, that is to be drilled at the same height that the uh, basket is. Uh, you can put your basket on the outside, draw a dot and draw the hole. Uh, and here's what your drainage hole looks like. Then you just simply put the lid on top of the uh, second container, take the watering tube and run it through both holes. And now we're ready to add our media. The science or the concept behind this grow box is that with this uh, watering tube, we're going to fill the bottom of the container with water. But first, we're going to fill all of this area here with our growing media. <clears throat> the bottom where the media sits, and there'll be water underneath of the lid here, the water will seep into here. And then by a wicking action, the water will seep up into all the growing media. And you'll be watering your plant from the bottom up, which is an ideal solution. Uh, you won't get excess water because, again, you have the drainage tube. So the container, uh, the completed system, again, is what this looks like. I like to use a piece of black plastic just to keep the weeds out. Before I put the black plastic on there, uh, we start with a few plants. Uh, I like to have, for example, a pepper at one end, a tomato at the other, and then I have a cut holes for them, then I have a slit in the middle, and I grow a plant of uh, four or five bean seeds across here. You initially start, before you put the plastic down, by putting a row of fertilizer one inch wide on the growing media on either side. This will dissipate throughout the growing media and will feed the entire grow box for two to three weeks or more. When you have long growing plants such as tomatoes and peppers, you're going to have to supplement that by adding uh, additional fertilizer uh, every two or three weeks. And again, these, because these warm up very quickly, the soil and everything, you will find that you will get growth. Uh, these are only just a uh, few weeks old. Already we have tomatoes and peppers and uh, the beans have already flowered and are ready to start growing beans. So the advantages and the limits of a grow box is number one is you don't have to worry about watering every single day. So if you're gone for a few days, uh, you don't have to have a neighbor come over every day and water. Um, the container, the reservoir in the bottom, um, will feed it anywhere from three to five days or more, depending on the, 
how large the plants are and how warm it is. It's also easy to cover if there's any frost in the forecast. Additionally, one of the limits is remember that because of the water uh, and the growing media, it becomes very heavy. So you want to choose the location very carefully. It's not going to be able to be moved uh, very easily once uh, you've set it up. If you're growing this uh, on a lanai, you can go out and buy a little uh, uh, dolly. You can usually get them uh, for seven to ten dollars. Dollars. Place your grill box on the dolly, and you can roll it around your lanai if you need to. Uh, this is not practical out in a uh, garden setting on dirt because uh, the uh, casters are not going to work very well on soft dirt. Uh, each container does have limiting growing space. Uh, however, um, because of the relatively inexpensive cost of building one of these, you can grow as many as you like. I did this presentation a couple of years ago and I met a lady who was very familiar with it. And um, she had 12 of these set up. And the reason she liked them so much was again, she could create her own uh, pH and fertilizer needs for each type of uh, vegetable. So each one of them grew a different type of vegetable. Very important with the growing media is to remember not to use uh, a media that compacts. Uh, you want to use a potting mix and not a garden mix. Um, but even with a, a potting mix, I like to use a full bag of uh, perlite in there to make sure that the media does not compact. The whole concept of this is that the water is going to wick up from the bottom. And if the growing media compacts, uh, you're going to defeat that purpose and you're going to have less uh, water permeating the entire uh, size of the box. If you're looking at some different concepts for how to plant your vegetables, if you go out to this website at the Earth Box, uh, it will give you some really nice diagrams on how to plant different vegetables in a typical container. But again, a very nice uh, growing container for vegetables. Um, doesn't allow you make you water it every day. You can you know control your pH, um, but again, each container is limited in size. The fourth type of system is hydroponic. Now, the vertical hydroponic system shown on the right here um, is something I experimented with a few years ago, and I stopped including it in these presentations simply because of the expense of the system. However, um, a lot of gardeners kept asking about it. So I've decided to include it back into this and give you some of the benefits and uh, liabilities of this type of growing system. Uh, another type of hydroponic, <clears throat> of floating gardens. And floating gardens are an exception to expensive uh, hydroponic systems and we'll cover those uh, after the uh, vertical type of systems. So this is a schematic from Vertigro. Uh, Vertigro and Hydrostacker and Future Growing all sell these type of systems and all have the components or a full system. Uh, you can get these schematics from any of these people. Um, for example, this price here, um, looks somewhat reasonable to some people, but I'm going to tell you right away, it is only a starting or jumping off point. Uh, I probably had at least 50% more cost by the time I was finished with my system. But the concept behind that is that we're going to start with a large container that has our nutrients in it, uh, typically a 45 gallon trash can with a lid. You have a pump uh, with attached to a timer. Inside this uh, container is a nutrient system. So you're going to fill this with water and your fertilizer. There is the first problem that I encountered. The fertilizer is that I, I could never find 
a cost-effective fertilizer uh, for this type of system. Um, the expenses got very high. But anyway, your nutrient system is here. The pump pumps up along the nutrient line. These uh, drip embedders are little small plastic tubings that are about a quarter of an inch. Um, there's one on top of each one of these vertical systems. They go into a distributor box, which is just a small container with pebbles that allows the, uh, the water to uh, filter down through it. And then you have your growing pots. Each one of these pots are perforated in the bottom, so the nutrients <clears throat> drip down from one to the other. This is a, an example, <clears throat> um, a picture of the same schematic you saw before. Here's our 45 gallon container. Um, here is our nutrient line. Um, and then these are the stacking containers. Uh, these were bought from the commercial sites. Uh, the one over here, I just tried some experimented with uh, typical little plastic pots. Um, I found they worked just as well as the styrofoam ones. Uh, but these I found did hold up better uh, after a couple of seasons. Um, the sun and the UV made these a little bit more brittle, whereas uh, these design lasted a little bit longer. As you can see, you can grow a variety of products. Uh, you have herbs growing here. Uh, we had squash, zucchini. We have tomatoes growing. Uh, we had cucumbers. Uh, even experimented with some corn. Uh, so it is a productive system. Um, but again, my first problem was expense. The second problem is this container here. It is above ground. Uh, it is black. Perhaps you can paint it white. But the ambient air temperature and the sun beating on it all day heats up the nutrients. And what happens is the vegetables and the roots do not like the warm water and sometimes almost hot water that comes out of here. So I found out what the commercial sites do is they pump directly from an underground reservoir or from a well. And then when the water comes uh, up to the growing site, they turn around and have an injector, which will pump uh, the uh, liquid nutrients in there. The problem is the injector costs about $1,000. So now another expense. At that point, I decided that it, uh, the cost just wasn't worth the reward. So uh, certainly welcome to try it. Again, it is productive, but uh, uh, be aware, uh, especially of the fertilizer costs. If you can find those cheaper than I did, uh, you probably have uh, made, uh, leaped over the biggest hurdle. Here's some close-up pictures again. Here's our nutrient tube, a little emitter tube that goes down into a distribution box. Um, here we have beans growing. Here we have peppers and herbs. Again, you can see all of these are growing very well. Uh, it's just the uh, expense of the system that I had a problem with. So as I mentioned, another hydroponic system that's very uh, easy to set up and very inexpensive are floating gardens. Uh, here, all we need is some type of waterproof container. Uh, this one is a homemade one with uh, two by eight um, with a plastic liner. Uh, here, we have just small containers or a kid's kiddie pool. The kiddie pool is my preference. Uh, if you want just a few vegetables, you can use a uh, small container. Um, you start with a piece of uh, styrofoam. If you're going to use a something large, either for the kiddie pool or uh, of this size, you need a one and a half inch to two inch piece of styrofoam. You can go with a slightly less thick if you go with a uh, small container. Um, your growing containers are little uh, plastic perforated uh, baskets. Uh, they're usually about two inches in diameter. You're going to pre-drill those in the styrofoam. Uh, fill this uh, container with water. Uh, fill your uh, nutrient supply with water in the uh, container. Lay your styrofoam down and then insert your uh, baskets into the styrofoam. Um, and uh, 
it's very effective for uh, herbs and leafy vegetables. A uh, couple of tips here. There are two excellent uh, resources that you can use. A uh, printed one is from this Edis Ifus uh, publication. Uh, basically gives you everything, in my opinion, that you need for setting up a, a floating hydroponic. Um, these are basically from the same type of people. It's a YouTube. Again, shows you step by step. So like what I did, showed you how to set up the uh, grow box. Uh, both of these are excellent references. Um, please note that as you get heavy rainfall, that will change the chemistry of your uh, growing media uh, as you have an overflow. So you need to monitor that. And uh, if you didn't have uh, excess rain, your growing media would stay, uh, would stay the same and you wouldn't have to add any extra nutrients. However, with excess rain, you are gonna to have to check your chemistry and add additional nutrients. Um, I found that when you're growing leafy vegetables and herbs, uh, as you harvest them, you could actually replace the baskets and you could get two growing seasons, uh, each one of your batches of nutrients. Again, this is best for leafy vegetables as well as herbs. Now, personally, I'd like to add an aquarium aerator. Most of these publications do not mention that you have to have it. However, remember that roots love oxygen and the more oxygen you could get to them, uh, the better they do. That's why you add the perlite to, for example, to uh, growing media. Um, I just find that uh, having an aerator uh, increases the amount of oxygen to the roots and uh, you will increase your yield. So this, if you want to do something with hydroponic, uh, has its limits as far as what you can grow in it, but is a very inexpensive growing system. General tips on all of these as far as easy vegetable is to remember that in South Florida, you have two growing seasons, but summer is not one of them. The spring season, which is starting right now. You can plant anywhere from late January up until March. Uh, you can go out right now and start your garden. Uh, actually, at the end of February, your frost potential is over with. Um, but if you did have one, you might have to be remember you would have to cover. I start mine, I cheat. I started in January because I like to give the plants as much chance to grow before it gets really hot but I always have to cover them once or twice each season. Uh, the fall season, you can start in mid-September to uh, early November uh, and get a second season. Uh, your plants like tomatoes and squash, et cetera, that takes a little bit longer to grow, they are not quite as sweet as the spring season, simply because when the fruit is maturing, um, you, you, you're amount of UV, amount of sunlight that you're getting uh, in November and December is not the same as in March and April or early May, obviously. A bonus season is the winter. You can start planting anywhere from November to January for your cool season. So for your leafy vegetables and herbs, this is a great time to start growing them. Uh, it will work in these other two seasons, but some of them do much better during the uh, so-called bonus season. One season you don't want to try growing in is the summer. Uh, it's too hot on both the vegetables and you and I, who wants to be outside trying to pull weeds or grow vegetables when it's 95 degrees and the humidity is the same, and it has too many insects. Also, the summer season, especially if you have a raised bed, is the perfect time to solarize your uh, garden. As far as fertilizer with a vegetable garden, the best thing to do is use a complete fertilizer, anywhere from 888 all the way up to 15, 15, 15. Uh, you want to keep the nutrients at an even number. Uh, fertilizers such as miracle Grow, um, they're great for certain gardening, uh, landscaping techniques perhaps. But in a vegetable garden, the problem is they're loaded with nitrogen and they create a lot of leafy uh, growth but they do not create as much, uh, they do not have excellent for the vegetables, uh, the fruit themselves. 
In addition, um, your first application of fertilizer should be one to two weeks before you plant, especially in a raised bed. And then you continue to fertilize as a side dressing every uh, one to two weeks uh, throughout the growing season. If you did not use an organic uh, soil, then what you need to do is add micronutrients, get a fertilizer that is not only 888, but has as many nitro, micronutrients as possible. When it comes to watering, remember vegetables uh, require a consistent water supply. They like moist soil, they do not like standing water. Uh, with a raised bed uh, in particular, uh, I find that you need to water uh, two or three times a week. And whenever possible, water the soil, not the plant. That's why I showed you pictures and that's why I recommend micro irrigation as much as possible. Uh, when you water from a hose, you have a tendency to splash up uh, material from the uh, soil and that can lead to diseases, especially with tomatoes. So keep the soil moist. Uh, take a handful, put it in your hand, squeeze it. Uh, you want a little moisture, you just don't want it to clump. Drip irrigation is best. And if possible, use some type of mulch or plastic over the top to conserve the water. When it comes to weed control, the best weed control is just pulling the weeds when they're small. Uh, again, you can use some type of cover. Uh, remember to be shallow hoeing because uh, vegetables have also shallow roots and you don't wish to disturb the uh, roots of the vegetables. I find hand pulling is best and I try to keep ahead of it. And that's why I like raised beds. You do not wish to use herbicides during the growing season. Um, in fact, I don't use herbicides of any type. Uh, on my growing media anytime during the year. There is some residual effect. Pest control, the most important thing is to scout the plants often. Uh, twice a week is necessary. Remember to look on the underneath side. That's where the insects are hiding. Uh, take one of the leaves and shake it in your hand and you'll often see uh, the insects flying around. BT is an organic material that can be used for caterpillars <clears throat> and uh, vine borers, uh, especially helpful when you have cucubits like cucumbers, squash, zucchini. Uh, <clears throat> you um, apply it to the leaves when you first detect it. Uh, once the <clears throat> caterpillar, for example, get established, uh, it's very hard to kill them. Uh, you want to apply it early in the growing uh, day or late in the day. If you wish to use another material, <clears throat> bare advanced fruit, insect, and vegetable control uh, is one that's indicated for vegetables. Uh, this is a systemic. You only apply it uh, at the planting. If you're transplanting it, you only apply it once a season. Um, if you're planting from seed, as soon as your vegetables have emerged with two or three leaves, uh, you apply it. Uh, drench the leaves. Uh, again, it will be soaked in uh, around the soil. The roots will take up and you only need to do it one time. As always with any insecticide, uh, read the label. The label is the law. <clears throat> so my tips on the best vegetables to grow, which people often ask, is I like growing tomatoes, especially to cherry tomatoes. I find celebrity is a very good uh, tomato for uh, South Florida. They're, uh, Florida just introduced um, a new one that's supposed to be very good for the warmer client as well, Garden Treasure. I have not tried it yet. Uh, I like uh, Big Boy as well. You want to get one that has VFN on it. And that's the most resistant type to uh, insects and diseases. Uh, radishes are very easy to grow. Um, very quick. Um, you can offer subsequent plantings every two to three weeks. Um, I start planting them <clears throat> in the spring season in January. 
And usually my last planting is around March, because I find that as the temperature gets warmer, the radish also gets warmer and uh, it uh, can become almost like a, a hot pepper. String beans <clears throat> are also very prolific and very easy to grow. Uh, you wish uh, to get the bush type. They're not as uh, stringy and tough, uh, but uh, very prolific and will yield for weeks and weeks. Uh, bell peppers, bell banana are both very easy to grow in this area and also will be able to produce for anywhere from four to eight weeks. <clears throat> uh, I've actually had some bell peppers that produced uh, for four or five months uh, if they were uh, fertilized properly and, uh, and the watering uh, was kept up. Squash and zucchini can <clears throat> also be grown in the area. Uh, just beware of the squash borer. Uh, I, I find this sucker very pervasive and uh, so consequently, uh, that's why I use the uh, systemic. Cucumbers are the same as the squash and zucchini. Uh, the, the, the borer loves to get into the vines. Poinsett is a good variety for being resistant. Uh, what I learned again from Gene McElvoy, the extension agent, is with cucumbers, I just plant them every two or three weeks, new plants. Uh, that way, as the vines uh, become infected, I've got new ones growing up behind it. This way you can get a longer growing season with your cucumbers. Um, sugar snap peas, uh, I like, but they're difficult to grow because uh, they don't like the heat. So if you're gonna grow them, I would start the planting in November and January. Also remember, you're gonna have to create a, a trellis or something to hold up the yeah, sugar snap peas as they like to grow three, four, five feet tall. Okra is a very prolific uh, plant, um, and it's one of the few plants that you can grow into the summer, uh, as long as you're willing to go out there and tend to it. Uh, just remember, with okra, especially it starts getting warm, uh, you need to pick it every day. Uh, in fact, my experience is you need to pick it twice a day. Um, it will grow from very tasty to very uh, tough in a matter of just a few extra hours. Uh, I've seen the plants grow three or four inches in just a few hours in the afternoon uh, sun here. Preferably eggplant is not something that I like to plant simply because it attracts more insects than the other uh, vegetables growing here. And the last thing I need is attracting more insects. As far as, far as sweet corn goes, uh, I grew a lot of sweet corn up north. I love Silver Queen sweet corn. I came down here, was all excited when I saw the sandy soil and started growing sweet corn. Unfortunately, there's another thing that likes sweet corn just as much as I do, and it's called a fall army worm here in South Florida. Um, so if you read a lot of publications from UF, um, it tells you to go to Publix or Winn-Dixie if you want sweet corn. And that's also my recommendation. As much as I love sweet corn, I, I stopped growing it a few years ago. The nice thing to know is that the new hybrids of sweet corn, there are some varieties out there called, called sugar, uh, super sweet, sorry, super sweet. That's not an adjective, that's actually a name. What happens is they're able to keep the starch, the sugar from turning the starch for probably a week or more. So I have found these days that uh, I can go to one of the supermarkets and get sweet corn that's almost as sweet as I used to grow in my backyard garden up north. Oh, I right, thank you very much. I also want to thank Dr. Sydney Park Brown for her assistance and permission to use the original presentation. Um, and some of the examples, uh, I like to thank uh, Hydroponic Depot and Green Plant. My email address is at the bottom. If you have any questions, please uh, send me a note. Um, and just remember that there are a lot of products here. And just because I mentioned one of them is not the only one. It's just things that I've had good success with. So, hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, happy vegetable growing. Thank you.